Welcome to episode 10b of the Terea Guardians video series. This one is titled Florida Terea to Junaluska, North Carolina 2015 Report. And it's the second part of a two part series uh, that I began with episode 10a on a sister city very near there, Waynesville, North Carolina. Now this is a two-part series about a rewilding action that Terea Guardians took in 2008. And it's taking a look at nearly seven years later, what kind of progress has been made by the 31 seedlings of Terea taxifolia that we planted at that time. Now Terea taxifolia is the most endangered conifer tree, certainly here in North America, but possibly in the world as well. Its native range, so-called native range, historically known native range, is in northern Florida, just a very, very small area. And what we Terea Guardians did, a citizens group did in 2008 and beginning earlier too, is we actually moved, we conducted an assisted migration of this Florida Terea conifer up to the mountains of western North Carolina. Waynesville and then a city very near Waynesville, Lake Junaluska. Now why we did it uh, is a story that you can actually learn about if you go to 10A first, the first episode in this two-part series. That's where I spent quite a bit of time talking about why we did it. The action was significant enough that Audubon Magazine sent a reporter there, Janet Marinelli, and a photographer, and the article appeared in 2010 in Audubon Magazine titled Guardian Angels. Here you can see it. You can find it online by Googling Guardian Angels Terea. And the Terea Guardian pictured here is Jack Johnston. He was one of our first Terea Guardians, certainly in our core group. And he played a major role in this rewilding as he does in subsequent actions by Terea Guardians. So the first part of this video, the Waynesville one, documented the 21 seedlings that went to Sarah Evans' property in the Waynesville area. Now that's about 3,400, 3,600 feet. And this part of the series, the uh, Lake Genaluska part, we had 10 seedlings that we planted here at about 800 feet elevation lower. Now that might have made a difference because you'll see quite a difference in size and growth potential between these two sites. 3,400 feet in Waynesville and about 2,600 feet here at Lake Jodolaska. Uh, but part of the difference could also be simply that these two videos are three weeks apart. The Waynesville site I uh, filmed on April 1st and three weeks later, I came down to the Lake Junaluska site. And that three weeks can make a big difference in terms of the bud expansion. So what really matters is the number of viable vegetative buds that you'll see at the end of this video I end up calculating for both sites, not the size of how they look. Three weeks is a big difference. Before I show you the video results of the Junaluska site visit, uh, I'll give you a little background information. The seedlings we planted, the 10 seedlings we planted in midsummer 2008, uh, were at the Cornell Bryan Native Garden. Now, the Cornell Bryan Native Garden is a very significant place to plant because it is, after all, a native garden. Uh, and yet the people that are in charge of that garden decided that, yes, this is probably a native plant that was left behind in its peak glacial range. And at this time in um, geological history, and certainly as climate continues to warm, western North Carolina is certainly where it wants to be. Uh, there are other trees in western North Carolina that are doing well, and some of those are major contributors to the seeds that we get for further plantings that we do, both in North Carolina and testing northward in other states, Ohio, Michigan, elsewhere as well. We're trying to learn a number of things scientifically. That is, what's the northernmost range of Terea taxifolia in this climate, in this climate, 
and what are the preferred habitats? So in North Carolina, especially when we're in very mountainous habitat, we have an opportunity to really look at microsites, north facing slopes, south facing slopes, east, west, uh, how moist they are, uh, how close to creeks they are, what the associated plants are. It's really a terrific way to do some basic natural history to learn where this plant wants to live specifically in the mountains of North Carolina. And you'll be seeing that somewhat at the Genaluska site, but uh, in 10A video here, it really comes through in the Waynesville site in terms of moisture locations, ravines, are really the places that they seem to grow best. Now in 2008, we did plant 10 potted seedlings. What you'll see in this video are only the results for seven. And that's because three of them died their first winter. Not through any fault of their own, but simply they were probably planted too close to seasonal dwellings. One of which, the closest one, had a very visible bird feeder there. And so it's quite likely that the dropped corn and other seeds from there had the vole population explode during the summer. And then when the residents left for the winter, the voles were left with nothing to eat. And uh, so the three, the three seedlings we planted closest to that house all had their bark stripped away and beneath the soil too on the roots, uh, presumably by voles. So Janet Manning, who is the director of horticulture there at Corney O'Brien Native Garden, immediately got around to putting wire cages at the bases of the remaining seven trees. And you'll see some of those in the videos that follow. Now at both the Waynesville site and here at the Genaluska site, we planted the trees and made note using names rather than numbers. Uh, names of famous botanists, foresters, conservationists. Uh, and as it turned out, it was very easy to remember them. So you'll see the names here. What I'm going to start with, though, is first a slide to show you the portraits of the seven people that we chose to name the plants here. I didn't include the portraits for the, uh, the Waynesville site, but here you can see them. I'll talk a little more about who each of these people are when I get to each of the individual plant monitoring videos. Oh, and here are the names of all 10 that we planted, and you'll see the first three uh, were the ones that the voles killed the first winter. All three of those are famous botanists. Finally, I'd like to note that you'll be seeing here my assistant, glimpses of my assistant in the video, uh, Jim Thompson. He's one of our newest Terea guardians. He's planted some Terea seedlings at his cabin in Cullowee, North Carolina, and he's germinating some more seeds now. At the end of the video monitoring report of each of the seven uh, Terea taxifolia at Corney O'Brien Garden, I'll come back here and talk a little bit about an analysis. I'll show you the charts of data collected. Uh, but what's important here is the visuals. That is that I may not see, other people may not see right now in data uh, what we need to know in order to learn how best to plant Terea taxifolia in northward environments. But other people in future years looking at these same videos might be able to see m more learnings here. So I hope that will happen. Now, here's to the video report. So here's a good view of the top of William Bartrand right in the foreground. And here you can see Hemlock behind. Uh, there's that massive red oak and that's a white oak over next to it here. Um, here's the growth form. This is the oldest branch we would have planted and interestingly enough, it's I'll, I'll get some data on that, but it's Still got some terminal growth here, so it's still photosynthesizing, but you can see what ultimately came up. Uh, terminal was here, but nonetheless, when we go down here, we see 
You can see the basils that are there. This is a another one growing up right here. Um, and it's got some, but it's it's got it's got three buds, four, four coming out of that one. No terminal, but just lateral. And this one here, we've got a terminal. Uh, last year it would have grown, but it wouldn't have put out a terminal. And this year. It's getting a really nice terminal. Okay, and again, that's the red oak and the hemlocks. This is Rachel Carson, and I just wanted, while the sun's out, you can see the sun is shining on this part here. And uh, what's interesting is that we've got a total of six years of growth coming out to the tip, and then these triplets there coming out, uh, that'll be this year. So that'll make seven years of growth. Uh, but what's fascinating is that right in the interstices let's see where do I find it not there yeah, it should be down there yeah right there right in the center of the picture there's a little leaf bud coming out there um, moving down look at that we've got golly what three of them coming out there and it's it's perched kind of facing the Sun it's certainly not horizontal here kind of at an angle capturing the sun and so it's willing to um, put something out beyond just the flat U-like growth pattern when it's in the sun like this. Here's another interesting growth pattern here. This branch reaching out, you can see some's in dappled sunlight. Uh, it's a total of six seasons of growth and it's got some uh, good triplet at the end there. But if I go back to six growing seasons below before you can see that last year it put out some new growth right from an old branch six years ago and you see good reason why right now it's in the sun this time of year it's in the sun now we've got a rhododendron right alongside it here so that's shading it here we've got a beautiful red oak and if I look straight up from here not getting into the sun, we've got a whole canopy of red and white oak, so it's just going to bring this place in. Now we've got a couple small hemlocks right up here. See these hemlocks? Oh gosh, that one's got a lot of woolly adelgids on it, so those are going to go at some point. Those are going to go. And here, let's look down, straight down on the top here. Look at that, even though uh, below we've got all four branchlets coming out. For some reason Rachel decided to put five lateral branchlets out. The terminal bud is green. It's pretty thin and small this year so I don't know what it's planning on doing. Looking down at the growth sections, you can see how old and brown that is. And look at, look at how knotty that was. Several years would have gone by. Branchlets would have dropped off because there's only two remaining there, each going up catching some sun. So two would have dropped off. Um, but then, just last year, it would have put up this, uh, this vertical growth and there's the opening five buds for this year so very interesting what's going on with Rachel Carson that's got two years of growth on it and look at the powerful three lateral buds coming out in a very strong terminal um, and there's a doublet coming out of there so this 
This tree is doing some interesting things. This is Aldo Leopold, and <laughs> we've got some buckeyes that's starting to grow around here. When we initially put this in in 2008, there was nothing but roadies on the side here. Uh, what's interesting is that you see there's absolutely no, no, there, uh, no terminal bud. There's there's two vertical stems here. This one here has no terminal growing this year. And this one here has no terminal growing this year, but we've got triplet, 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 doublet, triplet, 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 doublet. So it looks healthy. Everywhere looks healthy, but it's certainly it's certainly not putting on anything vertical every year. Now let me go down here. Oh. see the, the height that goes on, looking down to the stem area. Here's a, a, what would have been the original one, which it's given up on, and you can see some dead coming off of it. One would expect that. Looks like there are two other stems there that each have, yeah, two stems right down at the bottom there. Each of those have a terminal coming out of them. Very interesting. So it's got two terminals pretty much parallel to one, one another. And here's the setting. Looks like a small birch or alder right here. A couple small buckeyes again. These are very new. Moving around here, we've got the rhododendron. And this is looking straight up at the canopy here. These would be the oaks just beginning to leaf out a little bit. So this would be very, very dark in here. Rhodes on this side. Roadies on this side, trail down there. It's the ground level looking up here. And uh, looking uphill, up there's the road and a house. Okay, this is Lucy Braun, and she actually has three stems that are doing, there's one, the smallest one, that actually has a vertical component to it. Here's the main one, right there, that has a vertical component. And the other one is right there. But you can see how healthy off this main one here, um, what she has going. Now, as I move down here, to give a little side view of her. She really did well. There and there. Look at look at how she's going up there. Side stems, not so much, but she's she's getting something you now. Just want to make sure. Oh yeah, here you can see there is both 
four laterals coming out and there is a beautiful terminal bud. So she's going to be heading up, heading up slope again. Just magnificent. So here's the surrounds. Oh, you can see it's a very steep slope here. So here's what she gets to contend with. Ha ha ha. Here we are, east facing slope. And here is a gigantic white oak here. There's a some roadies up there. Down here it looks like it gets pretty dark because we don't have much growing down here. She lucked out. There's a big branch that fell by and it didn't get her. Looks like we've got another white oak there. Another white oak going down to the trail there. That's this little one here. But you can see just from the, the forest floor here that this gets pretty dark. We do have a roadie right over here and continuing there. And Jim is going down to Wangari Matai. Let's go take a look. Okay, Jim is pointing to the top of Wangari Matai. I'm just getting kind of the scenery here. Here's the path. There by that uh, orange flag up there is Lucy Braun. But as we look around here, oh, this looks like a nice little dogwood. Oh, sweet shrub. you got a sweet shrub right behind you. The purple blooms. So there she is. Let's go take a look. Right there, how many is that? Yeah. That's five. Boy. Four. Three. This has got a lot. Three. Every one of these is big. Yeah. Now she's got a second. She's got two and this vertical got six stems. Branches. Now, but the main thing I want to show here, this is really important here. Um, we normally see these are two about equal vertical st uh, stems, total of 108 buds on here compared to 99 total buds. Uh, two years ago, springtime two years ago, so it's uh, definitely growing. But what we see here is on the stem to the left. Last year was a ladder or was a terminal that came up, and it's got both a terminal bud and four laterals. Now this one did not do a vertical last year at all. It stayed there, um, but it is sending up a vertical this year. There it is. The vertical in here. Right there is the vertical. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And when I go down like this, you can see the distinctions here. So, yeah, here are the two. So when I record the one on the right, the, the top whorl is right at the top. And the one on the left has got the vertical growth from last year. But look at how healthy, how healthy this tree is. Very, very good. This was planted, it was full sun. Oh yeah, very. But right past this sweet shrub here, um, there's a hole in the canopy and that's kind of southwest facing a little there. So it's able to get sun. So you can see what it's doing. This is Hazel Delcourt, April 25th, 2015. And basically she's not bothering to put much of anything out anymore on that shady side and is putting all her energy into this side of the tree. Very interesting. But she's also got 
He's also got some things very near the stem. Look at that. There's some little leaf buds coming out right on top of the stem there. So she's not ready to... Uh, She's not ready to just give a normal form to this. And then over on this side up here, look at the little leaf buds coming out. Okay, so this is the fourth whorl down. And very interesting how this is on the only place where there's any possibility for sun. And look at how the main branchlet there has got right on it. Uh, one, two, three, four. Ooh, and up there, more. It's going to be sending out branchlets there, probably single leaves there. But uh, let's go and let's use this one and count. Okay, first whorl, so one year there. No, no, actually, one or two growth seasons there. Three. There's another whorl for another growth season. And another up from there. And another up from there, and another up from there. There you can see some quintuplet, I think, on that end there. That is the one reaching out the farthest, still possible, to get some sun out there. And here's a look at the top. So, right there. Okay, we're an hour or so later back at Hazel Delcourt, and look what's happened. It, we started off, it was an overcast, it had been a rainy day, but we're in full sun now. And here we are at noon, and Jim, tell us about what, what we see here. So the, the sun's right about there. Uh huh. And it looks to me like we're going to have sun on this plant all the way to the sun right over in here. Yes. At least until this tree right here leaves out. Until that one leaves out, let's see who this tree is, because, wow, that's a lot of sun on here right now. Look at that. Even this lower branches are getting some sun through here. Where? Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's keeping healthy. Sure, wherever it gets some sun, it's say, hey, I'm going to keep these going. Very interesting. My guess is you'd have sun until it gets behind that tree way over there. Okay, so here's the sweet shrub. Oh, okay, so, yeah, right, right. Okay, so here we are. Oh, in fact, let me go up with the camera here. Obviously, I'm not going to put it in the sun, but whatever this tree is in front here, uh, it's deciduous. The leaves aren't going to get much bigger than they are now, but they're going to get a few more out. So this is going to be always dappled sunlight. This is nice. Here we are at Henry David Thoreau. I just had to take this picture. Look at these two lower branches down here. There's Henry going way up here. But these two lower branches has got sun. See the, the sun when the wind blows here? This sun is coming directly through, not the trunk, but the branches of a white pine that I'll take a picture of later. So what this indicates to us that Terea should have no trouble growing beneath a white pine, that the white pine is not as dense as some conifers, and quite a bit of sun can actually can actually get through. I think here's a little bit on here too. Yeah, a little bit on that stem. Good to learn. Okay, so what we have here is um, much slower growth last year at the terminal and instead of four laterals coming out we've got three and there's a repressed terminal there but you can see how each of the whorls going down here Here's the sunny side going out, or at least where the sun's going to be in the late afternoon. This is the one place where it can get some sun pretty big. And we've got quintuplets and triplets, all kinds of things coming out there. Um, there you can see some singlets here. 
But over on uh, the oldest that we found in terms of growing seasons on these whorls were five on some of the lower ones. But what's exciting is that the quintuplets, there's a quintuplet right there, and the triplets, there's another one right here, um, are on, here's another quintuplet here, they're all moving horizontally. And even here, even here on this relatively shady side, I, I just had taken a picture there of some sun coming through, we've got uh, a triplet over here. So given that we had such really strong terminal growth in these growing seasons here, but last summer right there, it's only I think that was three and a half inches, I think it's deciding that maybe it really cannot compete with this white pine in getting into the canopy here. This was a small white pine. Uh, I think I counted about for when we would have planted it, it would have been right up to about there in height, so it wouldn't have been blocking much, but you see it's just been going gangbusters. So it's doing what Tories do, and that is they sort of figure out what makes the most sense for getting the most sunlight while they just wait it out. They, they don't have to get tall before they have a chance. Oh, look at this. Here we've got some sun coming in. It's about noon coming in through here. And there's a basil going out there. Oh, and the basil, the basil has a, um, the basil has a repressed terminal. You can see there were two years of uh, stretching up to the sky, and then it's it's got, you know, it's got some nice. It's going to keep growing out from there, but it's not bothering to put on anything vertical there this year. Final section, some analysis and questions. First thing to mention is it's very important to know that there was no assistance given to these plants after they were watered uh, a few weeks after planting in 2008, midsummer is not a good time to plant, so watering was essential. But no assistance given to any of the plants at all at Cornell Bryan Garden, except except for the wire uh, foundational guard systems after the first winter and the, the voles had killed three of the plants. So that's the only thing there. And this is very, very important because we're attempting to rewild Terea taxifolia back into the Southern Appalachians. Uh, it's very different from the Endangered Species Official Recovery Plan in Northern Florida, where they're doing all kinds of things to um, try to make it possible for the tree to grow there again after it was killed by a variety of diseases. We say, we say climate responsive diseases, which is why we felt we needed to move north. But nonetheless, the important thing is to know that with our data, there's been no manipulation going on other than uh, the wire protection at the base. And this is the same for the Waynesville site, too. And I'll move on to the Waynesville site at the, uh, after I finish the analysis here. But starting off with the two last uh, trees that we looked at, the, the two tallest ones, neck and neck down the stretch, Hazel and Henry. Um, what's going on there? Why are they so much taller, so much more vibrant uh, than any of the other ones that were planted there? Now again, it's just a total of seven that have survived these first seven years at the Junaluska location. So five look sort of normal, like normal terea trees growing sideways more than up. But Hazel and Henry, they were going gangbusters. Now, not so much the last two years, but there was a spurt in there that really put them up. Why? Was it because they were planted pretty much in full sun at the beginning and now they're starting to get shaded as the trees and shrubs grow up around them? That's a big question. That's something worth knowing. 
Now let's take a look at the full chart for all seven plants at the Junaluska site. Here we can see that Aldo looks to be having a bit more problems than the other, but still it looks vibrant. Uh, one of the problems, though, is that at the Genalusca site, we did notice that there were some buds coming out of the older branches inward of the tips. Now, when I did bud counts, all I was counting was what you actually see at the tips of branches or at the apex of the vertical stem. So the trees were, some of the trees were putting energy into creating extra branchlets along some of the inward section of the older branches. And so uh, the data there, a number of bud counts, isn't really reflective on what's going on in terms of vigor. So you really have to take a look at the plants. They do, all of them, look very well to me, except I think Aldo is getting encroached upon by the rhododendrons. I would learn to never put a plant that close to rhododendrons, and it's got it on both the north and the south sides of it. So that is a learning. Uh, it's a question as to whether anyone will go in there and decide to prune back the rhododendrons. Either way is fine with me. It's important that, uh, to mention that we didn't get full data on all the trees. Didn't get any data. I don't know. I must have re started recording it on some other piece of paper, but on the William Bartram tree, no data in 2015. And in 2013, uh, we skipped altogether Lucy Braun. So the, both of those trees, there's no comparison as to their trending and their growth patterns. Moving to the Waynesville site, this was covered in the 10A video, uh, the Sarah Evans property. Again, 21 total seedlings were planted there, and through the years we've been losing them. I'm not even bothering to count as alive or put much energy into looking at anything other than those on the darkest, moistest, coolest side of the property. That's east-facing slope that's got the waterfall by it. Those are the only ones that are healthy, and they all look fairly healthy, with Maxilla looking the healthiest, which I think is appropriate given that Maxilla uh, is the woman who owned the property. Sarah Evans inherited it from her, and the Maxilla tree is the one that's doing the best. I'd like to patch in here now Sarah Evans talking about her mom standing right by the Maxilla tree there at the Waynesville property because Maxilla played a very crucial role in the birth of Cornell Bryan Native Garden. Let's take a look at what Sarah has to say. The Cornell Bryan Native Garden was created in the early 90s. Uh, with, with a bit of an endowment from Bishop Bryan, um, named for his wife, who was one of a committee that thought, let's have a garden here. It's a beautiful acre and a half area that neighbors thought if we made a garden, then they might not sell it off for houses. My mother got involved in the beginning and she persuaded them to make it a native garden and she donated the collection she'd been creating for decades to that garden. So a great deal of the first plants came from right around here where she had them planted. Um, and for 10 years, she worked full time to bring that garden to life. So I think of that garden as her Sistine Chapel. Many, many people worked on it, but she was the visionary. Comparing now the Waynesville site against the Junaluska site. Again, Waynesville is so important because we are definitely learning a lot about preferred habitats, that is, micro conditions in the same piece of property. Uh, slope, moisture content, uh, associated plants, lots of things that people can come in later in future years and probably discern more than I can discern. But it's very important for learning preferred microclimates there. Negative results, that is death of trees, are to be applauded in this case because it's only through these negative results that we can make 
pretty, pretty strong disclaimers about the absolute need for having moisture-loving plants, such as hydrangea and trilliums, nearby where we do future plantings. But distinctions between the two sites, again, Waynesville is about 800 feet higher in elevation than the Junaluska site. Uh, the Junaluska site is entirely either south-facing at the upper end of it, that's where the two tallest trees are, Henry and Hazel, uh, but the other trees are all on an east-facing slope. The survivors in Waynesville are all on an east-facing slope. Now consider it, east-facing means that you get sun in the morning and you lose it in the afternoon. And during the summer when the heat may be the uh, most stressful, you're kind of out of the heat in the late afternoon if you're on an east-facing slope. So I think we can pretty much say that when in doubt, plan on an east-facing slope. Uh, Lee Barnes, since the beginning, has thought that that was a very important thing to do and be very cautious about south-facing slopes. Uh, we'll need a lot more data to make final conclusions on that, but I think we're on a good start. Two very important caveats about this 2008 rewilding action. They all came from the same nursery, and our estimate, they were at least two or three years too long in the pot. That is, they were too tall, too root-bound for healthy planting out. Uh, we've certainly learned that we need to plant things out much earlier than they were there. So it's not a surprise that some of them were very stressed from the beginning, especially since Jeff Zahner has told me just this past year that his experience is that it looks like they have a taproot. And when you have a tree that has a taproot, you do not want it to be root bound at all. Otherwise, it's going to have to uh, move backwards a, a little. That is, re regress in terms of its growth habit before it can start going on. And we've certainly seen that with a couple of the specimens. Annie Dillard, in particular, entirely lost its original main stem and put up a couple basal stems that, that then have... Uh, become the main stem. So it had to regress before it moved forward. Maxilla is on the same original stem as is Celia Hunter, and Celia is the only one not from the same uh, stock from the nursery. Uh, she came from, as a gift to me, from the Atlanta Botanical Garden. But that's an important caveat. If we were to do it perfectly next time, we would plant the seedlings out when they were much younger, much younger. Another thing to think about in terms of these particular potted seedlings, a caveat, is that it looked like where they were grown when they were in pots is a very different sun situation from where we planted them. And that is a, the, the growth form that they all had was pretty much going up uh, thick, full of branches, kind of like a normal conifer looks. And what we saw all of them all of them shifting toward was more of a U-like form, and that is having the branches not moving up as much, but basically going horizontally and moving out. That is something you'd expect to find when you've got a lot of shade you're dealing with, and so you're not putting your energy so much into the vertical as you're putting it out into the horizontal. So again, from the potted seedlings, our plants had to regress from that um, and begin all over again to grow in a correct form. Another thing to think about for more successful planting. And uh, in the Waynesville site, of course, I've planted in some more seeds directly into the soil. And as those seeds grow, they will be growing exactly how the habitat nurtures them to grow. So if we can be successful with planting seeds directly in, obviously that will be the best way to go. But we have a number of years to watch how those seeds are doing uh, to see if that's actually a viable technique. Until then, uh, signing off for Terea Guardians, this is Connie Barlow, June 2015.